brothers and sisters in Christ, yesterday I had the wonderful blessing of being at our diocesan center in southern Michigan. It's uh, called Vatra Romanyasa, which means the Romanian hearth. Sure, and we call it for short the Vatra. Because the hearth in the traditional home, you know, it's the fireplace at the center where everyone comes together. And that's what we did. And we were very blessed yesterday to celebrate the hierarchical divine liturgy with all of our bishops, not only Archbishop Nathaniel, but also his auxiliary, Bishop Irenaeus, and then our Metropolitan, Tikhon, Archbishop of Washington, and the Metropolitan of all America and Canada. Well, along with, I don't know how many, there must have been at least 50 priests there, and three or four deacons, and so forth. So it was a wonderful event. And what I want to share uh, with you from that event are some of the, some of the uh, words and, and the spirit of what uh, his beatitude told us in his sermon. Now yesterday's gospel was the gospel for the Saturday before the exaltation of the cross. The Feast of the Holy Cross is next Saturday. So the weekend before there are some gospels that are read in preparation. And he pointed out in this gospel which, uh, which is telling us the, Lord, the words of the Lord, if you love father or mother more than me, you are not worthy than me. Or if you love brother or sister or husband or wife or daughter or son more than me, you are not worthy of me. And he made a very good point. He said, many of us, when we, read, we hear these words or we read them in the gospel, we think of them in a pessimistic manner. We read them negatively. We think, ah, I guess I should love my father or mother as much as I do, or that I love my children too much. But he said, if we actually read it positively, with the right disposition in our spirit, with a good attitude towards the Lord, we actually find that it's not saying that at all. It's not saying we should love other people less. In fact, it doesn't say that at all. It's just saying that we should love God more. So what that actually means in the end is, you should love your father and your mother, or your husband or your wife, or your brother or your sister, or your son or your daughter, as much as you do. In fact, you should love them more. What? Yes. You should love them more than you already do. But the only way that you will ever be able to love them more than you do is if you actually love God more first. Does that make sense? Does that sound a little counterintuitive? The thing is, is that when we love other people more than we love God, we have distorted love itself. We have distorted our relationship with other people. And the love that we have for them is flawed and can in fact become destructive. When we love God first and most, then we have a clear understanding of what our life is, what the purpose of our life is, and how to live our life, and what our role is in relationship therefore to other people. That we are here to give our lives for others as God gave His only begotten Son so that whoever should believe in Him may be saved. We just heard three Gospels, one from John and two from St. Luke. I read, I threw in the Matthew's Gospel for the feast. And if you notice, all three of those had to do with love. With the love between people and the love of God. In the first one, we just heard those very words, famous words of the Gospel of St. John. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. In essence, he loved us. And he loved love more than he loved himself, if you can imagine. He was willing to give his only begotten son for us. His love was self emptying not self-serving. I guess that's what I'm trying to say, so don't read any dogmatic theology this week into what I'm saying. And that's loving God more than you love even God does the right thing in that respect. The second, John the Baptist in the womb loves God more than his own mother. Because even as much as the infant loves the mother, John in the womb 
recognize the Lord and love God first. And the Virgin Mary, likewise, accepted to become the mother of God. Behold, let it be to me according to thy word. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. She loved God first at the expense of her own life and her own security and her own good reputation and took a huge risk. And then Martha and Mary, the two sisters. Martha wants Mary to come and serve her, to love her sister first. And what does the Lord say? No. Mary has chosen the better part, and it will not be taken away from her. Mary chose to love God first and was blessed, whereas Martha had a flawed idea of love. Her idea was she should help me do the work and the earthly cares. And that's what's most important. And when you have time, and when you have some freedom, and you have, and you've, you've done all your other things that I think are important, then you can think about God. Then you can sit down and hear the words of the gospel. Then you can do your prayers. How many of us do the exact same thing? We want to say that we love God, but we put Him late in our priorities. And really. I never, I've said this before, I don't understand why people use the word priorities. There can only be one priority because there only one thing can be first. What did Dale Earnhardt said? There's one winner and how many losers? There's only one priority in our life because only one thing can actually be the first. It come in first place. And if it's not God and God comes in in second or third or fourth or even in last place, that all the other things that came before actually give us no glory whatsoever. They give us no satisfaction whatsoever. They in fact become a poison to us. How many times I talk with people, even with my own family members, and they, and they say, well, you should talk to so-and-so. They need to shape up their act. They need to do this. They need to do that. I said, they don't need to do those things. You're right that they're not doing the right thing. They don't need to. They don't need to work harder or shape up or do all those things first. Those will come later. The first thing that is the problem is that in their lives and then even in the lives of the person complaining, God has not been put first. God has not been loved most. When we love God most and first. That changes us. That changes how we view everything in our lives. We realize that every step we take and every action we take has meaning, has consequence, has an effect and an influence on other people. When we love only one person more than God, or our family, a small group of people more than God, we become ignorant. We become blinded to the impact that we are making in the world. Because we have narrowed our vision and our focus to something finite. Our family names may go on for generations, they may go on for centuries, but they eventually will be gone. And we can bank on it. They might be remembered in history, but the families themselves will disperse back into the grand gene pool of the human race. Our only real eternal heritage, our only real inheritance that we can offer to the generations past us is the eternal life of Jesus Christ. Is the eternal life that comes from knowing God, hearing the word of God, and keeping the word of God. And this is why the Virgin Mary is who she is. Not because she just had a great pedigree or that her parents loved her a whole lot. In fact, they loved God more. She loved God more than her own self and her own pride and her own glory. So brothers and sisters, if you want to love your family more, when you love God first, not only do you change yourself, but you change them. Because they see what matters in life. They see what's really important. They see what their life is really meant to be, instead of worrying about how it affects the family name, or how it reflects on you, or how what earthly glory they could find themselves will matter. 
And lastly, brothers and sisters, when we love God first, and God is love, that means that that love enters into us and lives there, becomes a part of who we are. This is why God says, I will come and dwell in them, and they will dwell in me. I will dwell in their hearts. So guess what happens? We think we know how to love people when we love them first, and we think we're giving them some great credit, but we're actually loving them in a very limited and small way. Really a self-serving way, a perverse way. But when we love God first, then that love of God dwells within our hearts. The love that is possible within us is multiplied exponentially. Because suddenly we are tapped into a, what? A fountain of living water, right? From which one will never thirst again. And we'll be able to love people more than we ever thought was possible. My biggest guilt, my, here's my confession. My biggest shame for me every day is I realize I don't love as much as I should. I get so wrapped up in other things, I forget. I'm not as loving as I should be. When God comes back into the picture, when God is put first, I can start to love again. I can really love people the way love really is. Self-emptying. Self-sacrificing. Not self-serving. So brothers and sisters, we're celebrating the Feast of the Cross. We're celebrating the Nativity of the Mother of God today. We're celebrating the Resurrection of our Lord. All of these things have to do with love. And if you want to know what true love is, love God first. And let His love multiply within you unto everlasting life. It's an infinite, endless love. You will never go thirsty. Price is <laughs>